I think we are in an entirely new era of digital transformation fueled by Gen AI. Is technology is already improving how businesses operate and how humans interact with one another. It's changing the way doctors care for patients. It's changing the way people communicate and even what, the way workers are kept safe on the job. And, you know, Gareth, this is just the beginning. <laughs> We have been so lucky to interview some incredible female tech leaders over the last couple of years, and this is right up there with the best. Helen Kaliski is the managing director for the UK region at Google Cloud, and furthermore is a philanthropist, a women in tech advocate, and an all-round seasoned operator in the world of cloud and software. Her insight was absolutely fascinating. We covered the nuances of leadership, the landscape of global digital transformation, what sets Google apart, and we also have a contemplation on how the evolution of generative AI will impact major players in the cloud industry over the coming years. Helen was a a joy to chat to. She's recently been named in the Computer Weekly Top 50 Most Influential Female Tech Leaders in the UK, um, along with a couple of other ex-guests, may I add. There's no surprise as to why that's happened. Helen is absolutely brilliant. Helen Kaliski, I am so excited to get you onto the Tech Leaders Podcast. How are you today? I'm great. Thank you, Gareth. Fantastic. Thank you so much for taking the time to talk to us. We always start with this one. You've held leadership positions in companies like Salesforce, OpenTex, and most recently Google Cloud. What does good leadership mean to you, Helen? Oh, I think it means quite a number of things. I'd say a good leader to my mind, puts themselves in service of their team rather than presiding. It's important that I am able to make everyone within my organization do their best work. They are not in service of me. There's only one of me. (laughs) So I am in service of them. So very important to be in service of them and not to preside. I think it's important to support your team, to give feedback and invite feedback back, right? Be prepared for that and promote a continued desire to learn. I think also what something that's very important is a good sense of humor. Always helps. <laughs> yes, always, always helps in a number of ways. And a good leader is one that makes their team feel safe so they're able to create and thrive and be innovative. But also you've got to find that balance between warmth and edge right? So a good leader needs to be able to fuel a sense of belonging, but also get the job done. So ensuring that everyone is doing what they ought to do, not just Mm. what they want to do. Always raises alarm bells with me if a leader is liked by everyone over a long period of time, because it makes me question if they're leading in the right way. What you want to be is respected, which doesn't always mean like, in my view, doesn't always being liked by everybody. Have you got any examples of somebody or some historical figure in the public domain who people would know about who you look up to in in a leadership sort of context at all? Oh, that's an interesting question. It can be a literary character if you like, Helen. I don't, you know, I'm just wondering if you've got any examples. Oh, I think there's some heroes in movies. I'm a big movie buff, and you know, you only have to think of movies like Gladiator. Oh, you know, where, I know where you're talking. Um, <laughs> <laughs> where you know the hero, the protagonist, is not always like you know that makes the story. Because actually they're making the difference yeah. and they're changing the outcome. No, absolutely. I really, really keen. That's the first time I've heard. We've asked this question, but eighty-four times, I think. But yeah, and, and a really interesting point about it's suspicious if a leader is liked by everyone. I've never really thought about it like that, but it is absolutely true. I think of Alex Ferguson. I mean. People did Perfect like him. Perfect example. People did like him, but they absolutely feared him. These players were terrified of him. <laughs> so, you know, he had, so by default, he was respected. So, um, so yeah, no, it's a really interesting topic. I could, I could go on all day on, on specifically that, that one question. But let's, let's maybe move on. I noticed you got uh, nominated number 39 in the, the Computer Weekly's Most Influential Women in Tech in 2023. I reckon you'll be in the top 10 next year, Helen, but that is an amazing achievement. <laughs> Thank um, you, Gareth. <laughs> what I was going to say, I think we, we did chat about this beforehand, but I think women in tech is becoming closer and closer to just the norm. It's not this sort of unique thing anymore. Why do you think less women enter the tech industry than men? What do you think the reason is for that at the moment, Helen? 
Well, I, what, what I'd start with saying, you know, I've been in this in industry over a generation. Gosh, that sounds like a long time, doesn't it? And we have come a long way. I think some women are put off just by the thought of it, maybe because they think they have to be technical and you don't. There are technical jobs and there are non-technical jobs. And I think everyone has got more technical and happy with tech as the years have gone by anyway. I think also the industry could do, and I think is doing a better job at recruiting in a way which is more inclusive, helping create an environment that thrives on, you know, inclusivity yeah. and diversity. And one of the reasons I love living in London is because it's such a diverse place to be. Oh, yes. And it is indeed. You know, I think, I think the industry is getting better at doing that, but these things take time. And so there's still a way to go. No, there absolutely is. But we are going in the right direction, aren't we? I just uh, we are, um, we are. And as you say, when we don't have to have awards for women, and we don't have to have awards dinners for women, and we don't have to talk about it, we can just talk about people in tech. Then we yeah, know we've we've got that, and that's the end goal. That's what I'd like to 100%. see. Hundred percent. People in tech awards with women. Winning an equal share of the awards. Do you know what I mean? Across, you know, that's that's right, where we yeah. need to get to, isn't it? I, I've got two daughters, and I'm just, I just, I, I'm suspicious that we still subconsciously and intentionally nudge young females towards uh, stereotypical traditional careers. Like I said, unintentionally, and maybe we need to look at that uh, from from that sort of grassroots level. You know, Gareth, you have the perfect opportunity to change it. You are one of the, you know, you are in a key position at having, you know, given that you have two daughters to make a real difference there. And I, I think some of it is, you know, the fathers that have daughters that is really going to help continue to drive this. Yeah, I feel under pressure already. Uh, thanks for that, Helen. But uh, yeah, I will. <laughs> <laughs> Not putting you on the hook or anything. You are a good leader, aren't you? You got me, uh, you got me, I, I get a performance managing me already. But yeah, <laughs> no, no, absolutely. I do agree with you. I think it is about confidence, isn't it? And I think it comes from the family, it comes from the home, doesn't it? I mean, we need young women to, to, to aim for the top and they need positive role models like you. So, you know, so, look, Helen, can we, for the listeners who don't know of yourself, they obviously would, would have heard of Google Cloud and, and would know about Google Cloud. Can you talk us through your formative years? Maybe what did you want to be when you grew up? Can you tell us about that early part of your career? Just to recap, so my name's Helen Kiliski. I am Managing Director of Google Cloud for UK and Ireland. I've been in tech sales leadership for more than 30 years and been in cloud, running cloud businesses for, for many years. I have a degree in business from Middlesex university and I also have a diploma in market research. What I do outside work is also really important. So I love to travel, although the recent pandemic has sort of held me back somewhat. But I have this uh, this goal to visit 100 countries and I'm at 51, Gareth. Right? Oh, wow. So I've got to get on with it. That's a great goal, by the way. I'm actually going to steal that. 100. I'm such an... Ex <laughs> I, I love traveling myself. I uh, love to play the piano. I took it. I used to play it when I was younger and then I took it back up with, during COVID. I love playing the piano and swim and run. And I've even run a half marathon. I, I think I might... I might consider carefully whether I ever run another one. But anyway, that was good. <laughs> and I also love movies, which we touched on. So uh, formative years. So maths was my favorite subject in school. I loved anything to do with numbers. But I also enjoyed the social aspect of learning, making new friends, experiencing new things with them. And because of this, I, I knew I needed to do something varied and in interesting that involved interacting with other people and, and learning and learning from them. And I'm constantly looking to learn from everyone in my life, my team, my customers, my partners, my children, my husband. You know, I, I always have this saying, every day is a learning day. And I joined the world from tech straight from university. When I graduated, I wanted a career in an industry that was fast paced and would give me the opportunity to keep learning at speed. And I thought the tech industry seems to be a good place to go. And I've never looked back, really, Gareth. Yeah, yeah sure. So can, can you tell us about your first opportunity then? How did you get into the tech sector? It was yeah. a good one. I went to work for IBM and, you know, stayed stayed for 30 years. But, you know, there was a time when it um, it was the right decision to to leave. And uh, and then I went to, to join Salesforce. 
uh, and then eventually ended up in in Google Cloud. And I'm always in, I always look to go to places where you know, if I'm given the opportunity where I feel I can make a difference. What are the important milestones? Do you look back on now and think, well, you know, that that was definitely a milestone? Maybe, maybe and what hardships as well and lessons did you learn along the way? One of the standout milestones of my career was actually leaving a company after three decades. And, and I think while there are many benefits of building a career in a single organization, you know, leaving it can be a little daunting. But embracing uh, embracing challenge, change is sometimes necessary, you know, in order, you know, I, I talk about my continued desire to learn and grow and and that's important. And sometimes it was just time. So, you know, since taking the leap from IBM to Salesforce and now Google Cloud, I've learned new skills, witnessed new innovations, discovered new interests, you know, every step, every step of the way. And that's really important to me. You know, one thing I also learned early on is to take a job where you feel you can make the biggest difference and and learn the most and that doesn't mean taking a job where it's the most popular or you know other people may not want that job but you mm. take it and it gives you an opportunity and you make it yours and that's a really good thing to be able to do as well i think what you put in is always going to be reflected of what you get out 100% uh, and you know it's all about finding new opportunities to continue to learn and again, about having a growth mindset. One challenge I, I did face um, that always sticks with me as a, as a leader was being asked by my leader at the time to let someone go. And I really didn't agree with this request or decision. And it really would have gone against my values as, as, a, as a leader and as a colleague. And, and I actually refused and discussed the issue with a with a so I sought help from a from another person I respected in the organization to help me manage my way through it and it was a very uncomfortable experience because I was going against my boss but it actually you know worked I worked a way through it and it taught me to stick to my values and seek help from those around me when I need it and be true to myself and I think also sometimes you need to take personal risk to yeah. be a leader 100 percent makes sense yeah, absolutely, it does. And I think, it, it, you know, you, you've touched on this, guys, but experiences that are smooth sailing aren't necessarily the ones that stick with you months or years later. It's the it's the, the hiccups that, mm. you you know, that you, you encounter along the way that you learn most for and that you remember, and then you can apply that learning going forward. Yeah, 100%. I think sports coaches and managers say, say it all the time, don't they? I mean, you don't learn too much from your victories, but you, you learn a lot from your losses. You, you kind of yeah. win or you learn, don't you? And it's the same in your career. I think it's yeah. the hardships that teach you the teach you the lessons. I'm sure there's probably a stoic quote to back that up, but um, <laughs> But yeah, I, I don't know what it is. But yeah, I think it I totally resonates. Can I ask you about culture? Because you've you worked at some of the most, I would argue, probably the most impactful company in the uh, ever in the tech sector, uh, or it's arguably anyway, yeah. I mean, cause it's, which is IBM. You were there for a long yeah. time. Salesforce, yeah. very disruptive yeah. organization as well. And then obviously Google most recently. Yeah. Let's maybe start with IBM. What did you, t- the culture of IBM, what, what lessons did you take from that experience that you took forward into your other companies? I think the training I received in oh, okay. IBM um, and working with brilliant people and dealing with, you know, IBM was a, is and was a massive company and dealing with all sorts of different companies and sizes of companies and countries and complexities it was an incredible experience and worked and worked with some some great people so you, you know learned a lot it was foundationally very very good um for me and I loved yeah. the company Salesforce, great company, very, very sales and marketing oriented, mm. enormous fun, super ambitious, just, a, a, you know, a, a real fun, very sales oriented company. Yeah. Google has an amazing culture in that it's got this incredible learning culture. And I keep talking, I, I know I keep mentioning the word learning, but um, I'm, I'm going to movies, Gareth. So I don't know if you've seen the movie Avatar. I have indeed. I love that that movie. I haven't seen the second one, but I've seen the first one. The first one's all you need. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and 
There's a saying, Moat, who is the heroine's mother, says to the hero, she says, it is hard to fill a cup that is already full. And I would say in Google, no one's cup is near full. And what I mean by that is everyone is keen to learn. Everyone is keen to help. Everyone understands that you fail fast, you learn, you move on. And I think it's quite a unique precious culture you know it's it's really important and and you you kind of you get used to it you know you almost sort of take it for granted until maybe you're meeting with other companies as I do and 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 you think you, you know and they ask you what's the secret of the Google culture what is Google's culture and you know it's explaining it to them yeah, I mean, some of the most disruptive, I should call it, software applications ever uh, have come, obviously, from Google, but have come from this 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 legendary innovative culture they got there, isn't it? Like things like yeah. Google Maps, Google Pay, you know, it's come from projects, side projects that the staff have knocked up, isn't it? And in uh, isn't it like one or two days a week they focus on their own project yeah. or something? Yeah. I don't know if they still do that, but twenty percent project. But is that? I mean, if you just have to talk about, if you just have to talk about AI, I mean. You know, it's important to remember that that Sundar Pichai, our, our CEO, announced that we were were an AI first company back in 2016. Nobody was really talking about AI in the mainstream then, were they? They weren't. No, you know, and we've got a long history of bringing AI innovation to enterprises and and to consumers. You know, we embed them into every element of cloud. We embed them into YouTube search. You know, which is used by which is used by billions of people. The, the, the sort of the culture of Google to sort of stay on the on the cutting edge of things. Maybe this is a good segue into AI because I was going to ask you about this anyway, Helen. How does uh, the rise of AI do you? How do you think that impacts your role at Google Cloud? I I suspect it will accelerate the move to cloud even more than it's you know, you know, it'll speed it up because you know, you can't really take advantage of AI or Gen AI unless you're in the cloud. So I think it will accelerate companies' digital transformation plans. I think I think that is that is true. Yeah, I think we will, you know, we're embedding, as I said, AI into all our all our products and and have done. We will be helping and are starting to help even and helping customers make the most of AI and Gen AI, uh, we're helping customers such as L'Oreal, we're helping all, all sorts of customers. I mean, more than half of the Gen AI startups headquartered in the UK use Google Cloud. So it's almost the sky's the limit, Gareth, in terms of yeah. the use cases and the problems and the opportunities that we discuss with customers and how AI and Gen AI can help them. So it's an incredibly exciting time um yeah i can imagine how excited or fearful are you helen do you think we're going to have loads of people out of work replaced by ai or how do you see it what's your take on that so you know if you if if you look at you know there's a big dearth of digital skills in in the uk market now so there's masses massive opportunity for jobs in that area in this area now i see that jobs evolve and they have done forever right and they will continue to evolve i think the thing i would say is ai won't take your job but someone who understands how to use ai may take your job if you don't (laughs) i've heard that line that that is absolutely spot on really isn't it that's exactly what it is it's such an enormous advantage for a person, you know, a reason, you know, an intelligent person who's good at their job, you put an AI layer on top of it and they become infinitely more productive. <laughs> it's, 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 yeah. You know, it's such a force, isn't it, you know, to be reckoned with. So maybe moving the, the emphasis back to Google Cloud then. So can you talk us through what problems Google Cloud are trying to solve right now? Yeah. So, I mean, Google, you know, is here. And by the way, Google is 25 years old this year. So happy birthday to us. So Google is here to make information universally accessible to all. And and that was our mission that was laid out um, 25 years ago. Yeah. We have a similar mission here in Google Cloud, um, but for businesses. So our, our goal really is to create a cloud where users can operate as simply as possible. That enables them to drive insights and, and value and value for their business, Gareth. So, the you know the overall proposition 
uh, a mission of Google Cloud is simple. It's to accelerate the digital transformation of every organization. You know, we serve customers in more than 200 countries. We solve critical business challenges across industries from governments to gaming. And, you know, we're at a very exciting time. Last year, we welcomed Mandiant to the Google Cloud family. It, um, it's a recognized industry leader. Uh, and Mandiant is what, what Mandiant is doing is adding critical capabilities to complement our existing Google Cloud security portfolio. So, right. and, our, and our aim is to offer an end to end security solution for our customers. And then we had Next uh, London earlier this month in Tobacco Dock, and we celebrated the fact that over 40 of the FTSE 100 companies are Google Cloud customers. Oh, wow. Yeah. And as I I think I mentioned before, more than half of the Gen AI startups headquartered in the UK are, are Google Cloud customers. We also announced really exciting partnership with the likes of BT, Gymshark, Unilever, Formula E. Who you know who are taking the next step on their AI journey with us and using our tools and, and services. So so really exciting. Because obviously you entered a marketplace which was dominated by two juggernauts, and obviously Google is a juggernaut in its own right. But I suppose you've been chipping away at market share for for some time now. Yeah. So but I, I'm quite surprised by those numbers. That's you've made some enormous strides in the last couple of years. I suppose is that. What, what what was the sort of stimulus for that then, do you think? What, why are you taking so much market share off these off the other two cloud providers? Well, I think, you know, there are a few core areas that I'd say set Google Cloud apart and, and why organizations decide to work with us. Yeah. You know, I'd say firstly, we have a, a unified data and AI platform, which means customers can really easily unlock the potential of their data to innovate faster and at scale. And I'll give you an example. So... Earlier this year, OXA, which is an autonomous vehicle software developer, tapped into our AI and data analytics to test and validate its self-driving technology, supporting the global uptake of autonomous vehicles in different industries. We have a modern infrastructure cloud. So this helps businesses and governments build quickly and securely and cost-effectively using AI-optimized purpose-built infrastructure. So um, on average, a Google Cloud data center is 1.5 times as energy efficient as a typical enterprise data center. Uh, And we have have lofty ambitions. We aim to run our data centers and campuses worldwide on 24 by 7 carbon-free energy by 2030. And we're on our way. Yeah. The other thing is we uh, we have AI powered features in in workspace that are really helping more than three billion users do their work their best work across devices and locations. I got very excited about this, Gareth, as you can imagine. We we announced recently that AI can actually attend a meeting for you and take notes. That is, and I and I, and I think I we do all love to have fewer meetings. <laughs> <laughs> One of my favorites. <laughs> Yeah, oh, absolutely. You could have someone to do podcasts for you, actually. <laughs> there you go. There you go. Who knows? I just wanted to mention security yeah, it. because it's just so important that, you know, we've spent 25 years um, keeping people safe online and we save, you know, our, we're building and we've we've built a, a, a set of offerings that really can save a cu- customers and companies a lot of money. It, you know, it's very expensive and difficult to hire security talent. And we continue to invest to progress to our North Star, which is what we call invisible security. So making it very pervasive and simple for everybody. Security is such a high, it's, it's such, such a big topic at the moment, isn't it? I mean, certainly with everything going on in the world, I think it's something yes. that you have to be, we have to be so um, mindful of going forward. Uh, can I can I ask you about Mandiant? I know you. It was an acquisition recently. Can you tell me a little bit about Mandiant, the the, the driver for the acquisition, and what the product? Just a little bit about the product. Yeah, I mean Mandiant. We really felt that Mandiant was a was a key acquisition for us to, as I said, to complete our our security portfolio, our security offerings, so that we 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 you know we can get to our north star, as I mentioned. Yeah, really, it's all about threat detection and actually helping customers to make sure that they are safe and that their data is safe. And Mandiant work with companies and organisations across the world, um, and and their reputation is is second to none with a very few people they can they can turn up and and 
really, really give incredible advice and help co- companies get back on their feet or ideally avoid uh, you know, any security breaches. Security has always been really important to, to Google. Right. So it's yes, it's it's important now from a Google Cloud perspective, and but it's always been critically important to Google for the last twenty five years or more. Yeah. Oh, fantastic. Well, what what innovation are you most excited about at the moment, then, uh, Helen? Uh, what what tech innovation are you ex- most excited about that Google are working on right now? So I think it's interesting, isn't it? Because um, you know, I'm really excited about the next the next step for cloud computing, if you like, you know, the market, the market has been through at least three iterations since the start of, you know, my career with cloud. The first being, you know, it was about cost cutting and saving money. And then it was about agility and the ability to really respond to business, you know, tech responding to business needs. And then it's been about unlocking the value of data to drive better and more timely decision-making. I think today it, really what makes me excited is it's about simplicity and it's about driving constant innovation in data security and sustainability yeah um, and making each of those as, as simple as possible i mean we can't talk about the future of cloud really without considering the impact of ai you know we unveiled a new technology called duet ai in may it's basically introducing powerful features across workspace and showcasing developer features such as code and chat assistant in Google Cloud. Yeah. And at this year's Google Cloud Next, which was in San Francisco in August, we went a step further and we are expanding the capabilities, integrating it across a range of products and services throughout Workspace and Google Cloud. So it's quite exciting what Duet AI can do. I mean, I've already mentioned that it can attend meetings on your behalf, which is top of the list for me. (laughs) It can write emails for you. It can draft content in documents with virtual assistant. It can enhance sound and video on Google Meet. It can contextualize data and provide quick summaries. It can summarize and classify threat information for for security. We've got customers already realizing the benefit of this. I I mentioned L'Oreal earlier, but it basically L'Oreal are using it to help them make better and faster decisions for their data. Yeah. Um, And they're reporting engineering productivity gains of a third. Yeah, so not insignificant. I think we are in an entirely new era of digital transformation fueled by Gen AI. Its technology is already improving how businesses operate and how humans interact with one another. It's changing the way doctors care for patients. It's changing the way people communicate and even the way workers are kept safe on the job. And, you know, Gareth, this is just the beginning. Imagine how good it's going to be in, say, five years, let alone 10 years, you know. (laughs) Can can I just tell you what my my dream is? Okay, this is how sad I am, right? So basically, when it comes to AI and all the things you have just described, I would... Be absolutely delighted if I could sort of, you know, my working day starts, I log in and I've got my digital assistant who basically has responded to my emails that came in while I was still sleeping and also, have, you know, put in front of me what my day looks like and suggested when I have a break. And, you know, I just basically have this like curated, like I said, almost like human like assistant who can just govern my day. You know, you don't have to attend this meeting. I will attend for you and I'll just take notes. So you take a break then, but you need to be focused for this meeting because it's important. That type of efficiency driven assistant, you know what I mean? That has to be, surely that's going to be possible soon. Who knows? It may not be very far away at all. I think some of this also will be, what do people want? You know, what's the, you know, do people want that? And what, well, I do. What's the <laughs> Well, that's a start, Gareth. That's yeah. a start. So who knows? It may not be far away at all. We're kind of already there in many respects. I know that our, like the summary thing that you touched upon yes. is incredible, isn't it? If I go onto a website, or let's say a website's not a good example. Let's say a blog. There's a big blog. i got two minutes until my meeting, and I want to read this blog. And the fact that it can read it for you and summarize yeah. it and give you the top bits that is are likely to be of interest. I mean that's that's an incredible um, that's an incredible sort of innovation right there for someone who's in a rush, isn't it? So I think um, things like that are just really exciting. Almost there, Gareth. <laughs> so look, I just wanted to go back to uh, to yourself then. So you're a very busy person, Helen. You've got lots 
lots going on, lots going on in your in your professional career. Certainly, you're obviously leading a big team. You have got a lot, lots of conversations to have and things. How do you stay? Two things: How do you stay productive, okay, and and on top of your game on a regular basis? But how do you stay organized, and how do you achieve balance in your life? A number of things. One is morning exercise. So I like to run or swim if I possibly can. Staying in the moment. So being present. Brilliant. Yeah. Sure. Um, and a good night's sleep. Very those, those are sort of three quite foundational things for me, fundamental things. You know, you need to start and end the day in the right way and make sure you're present throughout. I think that's what, Yeah, that's no, what absolutely. Say. No, that's brilliant advice. And have interests outside of work as well. I think it gives you more perspective and I think helps decision making. We talked earlier on, I asked you about inspired, if you were inspired by anyone on the leadership front, but it just in a more generic context, mm. okay, if you could have a coffee with anyone, let's say a half an hour meeting with anyone in the world, we can chuck in people who have passed on as well, if you like, so historical characters included, who would you choose and why? Can I have two? You can indeed, Helen, you can definitely Thanks. take two, as, I, yeah, as long as they're good ones. <laughs> okay, well, you can decide. <laughs> Uh, my first one would be Keanu Reeves. Wow, that's a good, interesting choice. I love the movie The Matrix, and I would Me love too. to be his Trinity. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> great movie, I have to say. It is a great movie. On a more serious note, I think Queen Elizabeth I, so I'm glad you've said I could have someone who had, had already passed. My view, she broke with tradition. Yeah, she didn't yeah. marry. She was a trailblazer and she ruled for 45 years. That's not bad. And that's, that's a long career as a leader. So, 100%. Yeah. <laughs> In a time when queens were not particularly prevalent anywhere. So, I mean, yeah. that was an unbelievable feat. It's certainly how she was, uh, you know, how her life began. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Because obviously she was just a disappointment because Henry VIII wanted a boy, sorry. A boy. And then for her to turn into this probably the be the greatest Tudor of all, arguably, was as an incredible story, isn't it? So, um, really so yeah, no, fantastic choices. I really like those. And, and I have to say The Matrix, one of the most impactful cultural films, certainly that come out of the 90s, I think, just incredible yeah. across the board. I, I'm really with you on that one, by the way, Helen. That's a brilliant choice. Looking back now, and I know you've got a long way to go, and, um, you know, loads of exciting things ahead. Certainly, you know, it seems like it feels like we're in the dawn of AI, and I'm sure you're going to be heavily involved in Google's strategy around around that. Certainly, Google Cloud. But looking back on your career, what 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 advice would you give to that person who joined IBM all those years ago when you started your career? What what advice, knowing what you know now, what do you what would you say to that person, Helen? I would tell myself to make the most of every day, to not be afraid to make mistakes. Time speeds up as you get older. So fail fast and learn from it. I would also say treat others the way you would like to be treated. This is the most vital career advice I would ever give. This applies, I think, to both life and business equally. It's an important trait for everyone aiming for success. Every sex and profession depends on interpersonal relationships. Yeah. And um, ambition should never come at the expense of empathy, respect and open communication. And finally, I say trust is foundational and a thread that should run through everything you do. Um, I'm sorry, one, not quite final. This is final. Make time for charity work too. It makes you feel grateful for what you have. It's good to give back. Absolutely. Can I ask you about your charity work then? And also as well, I haven't really gone in on this. Great answers, by the way, but I just wanted to make sure we cover your work with the WITT, okay? Mm -hmm. And also promoting diversity and inclusion in the tech industry and also any other sort of outside of work commitments, mm -hmm. actually, you know, things, certainly charitable commitments. What are you involved with, Helen? So I'll, I'll start with that first. Um, so I uh, belong to a, a, a charity called Mellon Educate. And Mellon Educate was started by a guy called Niall Mellon, who was a property developer. Well, he is a property developer, but he now builds or renovates schools in um, South African townships. And every year he takes a group of 300 people and we go out to Cape Town and we spend a week in a township renovating. We split across a couple of primary schools and we renovate those schools. And it is one of the most uplifting experiences 
That sounds amazing. Uh, you can you can have yeah. So we're doing this. So I'm um it's it's front of mind because actually we go in the middle of November. We're going to go. So that's right. a, that's an incredible thing to do and to see the joy on the children's faces yeah. when they get to see their renovated school is just unbelievable. We will put that on the show notes. That sounds fantastic. And how are you how frequently do you It's do it's you... annually and it stopped for a few years because of the pandemic, but um yeah, yeah. No, it's a it's a fabulous it's a fabulous thing to to go and do. Oh wow, that sounds like a fantastic venture. How long have you been involved with with that? Since 2018. And WIT, Women in Telco and Technology is is I've been involved with for the last at least 10 years. Um and we're a networking group that really is is there to inspire other women to get into tech and yeah. to build their networks and to learn. So we hold events about one every, once every six weeks for, for our, our network. We have a network of about 2,000 people, 2,000 women. Yeah. Okay. Well, look, I think that that's... Um... That's amazing. I mean, the, the, I, I have one final question, Helen. Okay, so it's just about we love a book. I know you love a movie as well, so we can chuck that in <laughs> instead if you prefer. Can you please give us, a, you know, a book or, or maybe a, an anecdote or a story or anything, anything you've been inspired by recently? Recommendation. So books, I'd say the first one is Leadership and Self Deception by the Arbinger Institute. Important book for anyone. It offers a real accessible way of understanding how leaders can unpack their own self-deceptions and yeah. destructive patterns to improve, you know, the way they work and the way they lead. Uh, I think it really helps you put a mirror up to yourself, which I think is 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 important. The other one, I uh, another one I like is The Tipping Point, Malcolm Gladwell's book. Oh, yeah, um, great book. Read that, yeah. Looks at social dynamics that lead to rapid change, like sudden drops in crime or mass consumer trends. Just find it really, really interesting. And then, and then finally, the book, a book called Factfulness: Ten Reasons We're Wrong About the World and Why Things Are Better Than You Think. So it's quite an uplifting book. And that's by Hans Rosling and Ola Rosling and Anna Rosling. Oh, okay, I've not come across that one. I'll check that out. It's quite a powerful book. I mean, there's a tendency in today's, today's world, as we know, to always focus on the doom and gloom. Um, but, this, <laughs> yeah. but this book talks about how everything isn't quite as bad as we think, and actually we're we're on a, a you know we're really on an improving trajectory in terms of people's lives. I'd say so. Yeah, of course. Live. You compare the way the world is now to what I know. There's a lot of problems, but I mean, you look back 50 years. I mean, there were so many more people in poverty as a percentage of global population. There was less women working in the technology sector. There was less. Everything was just a lot worse everything so i mean you know i think uh, we have we have a lot more to be optimistic about than most people realize so yeah gr it's a great point to end on helen thank you so much for your time i hope you've enjoyed coming on the tech leaders podcast thank you it's been an absolute pleasure gareth Wow, what a great episode. Helen, another top 50 most influential women in tech, named by Computer Weekly just recently, actually. Brilliant book recommendations. There was so much to draw attention to there. Absolutely amazing. I, I think a lot of it, most of it speaks for itself. And I think the, the, the one thing that stood out for me there was how seriously Google Cloud are taking AI. I'm sure it's the same with AWS and Azure. AI is clearly the, the so the, the core focus is is in the core is within the core focus of everything that the major cloud vendors are doing right now. Uh, that was the, the the thing that stood out for me was you know Helen brought it up a couple of times and 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 prompted. So yeah, I think uh, you know if if there was ever any evidence that uh, AI is is the future of these cloud products. I think that was that was certainly it. Fantastic episode. Thank you so much for downloading the Tech Leaders podcast. Please give us a like, a subscribe. We would really appreciate it. Our goal is to continue to create great content for you. So please download, subscribe, engage. It all every little helps. Thank you so much.